Yo, what's up guys? We're back for another UFC breakdown and predictions video. And this week it's for UFC 286. It's another great card by the UFC. It's going to be Leon Edwards versus Kamaru Usman 3. We're going to see the conclusion of that trilogy. Who walks away with the welterweight belt. And you got to really relish these cards recently, man. The UFC has been putting on some fire cards. And you know inevitably they're going to go back to a few of these fight night cards that aren't the greatest. So you definitely have to be happy and intrigued in these cards that we got recently and gonna have on saturday and yeah man besides that you already know i got 10 bets on the line for ufc 286 already i i like this card from a betting perspective the last time we had a lot of bets on a ufc card we came away with a winning night and we're gonna bounce back from last week last week was the second bad week we had on a um, betting side from ufc uh, predictions or ufc bets this year for me and um gonna bounce back from that but yeah besides that if you want to get access to that it's at patreon.com slash ma prediction guru this week there's also going to be an invicta on wednesday um if you guys want an invicta video put down in the comments if i get three comments asking for the invicta fc 52 breakdown predictions video i will put it out there but there's a invicta card ksw card and uh that ufc card so there's definitely some stuff going on outside of the ufc as well that i'm gonna be breaking down on the patreon but Let's get in this first fight of the night here. Veronica Macedo taking on uh, Juliana Miller. And um, for Veronica, you know, she's had an interesting UFC career, to say the least. She entered the company at 21 years old, and right away she got thrown in with top 15 competition. She had a ton of confidence, and you could see it in her first couple of matchups. She had a lot of swagger, but it seemed like after she got pushed a little too fast and she was 0-3, there was definitely some confidence issues, but she didn't manage to get a win. I mean, she submitted Pollyanna Viana. And that was a big upset. That was in August of 2019. Only fought once since then. That was in March of 2020. So it's going to be over three years since uh, Veronica Hardy has competed in martial arts. And she lost her last fight to Bea Malecki. So one in four and five UFC fights. But, you know, I don't know. I guess UFC likes what they see in her. They're giving her one more shot here. And she's still kind of been connected with the sport. She got married to Dan Hardy and she's been doing a lot of stuff with the full reptile channel and commentating for Aries FC so clearly she loves the sport and she stayed around it so hopefully she comes back and looks better last fight she fought at 135 and looked like she was out of shape so now she's coming back down to 125 and hopefully she's fit she's sharp she's only 27 so she still could come back and have a fruitful career if she can regain that old form she's training at the MMA factory so her striking is going to be on point, you know that. And she's always been athletic, dangerous, and skillful. So it's just about putting it all together and being prepared and sharp. But for Juliana Miller, she's looking to continue to build after winning the Ultimate Fighter. She debuted last August and she bustled through uh, Brogan Walker, finished her in the third round, and won that Ultimate Fighter title. And she finished two of the three fighters that she did fight on the Ultimate Fighter run. And at 26 years old, she's young. She's getting better. She trains at one of the best gyms for females in the world in Team Hurricane Awesome. And she's extremely tough. And in contrast to Macedo, who's had some trouble with mentality at times, missing weight, coming out of shape, and not dealing maybe with adversity and fights the best. Miller's extremely strong-willed. She comes in awesome shape. She deals with adversity really well in the fights. And... Skill-wise, Veronica Macedo is probably better by far on the feet, but the dog and Juliana Miller usually makes up for that in a lot of her fights, actually. But stylistically, it's a great matchup for Juliana Miller, in my opinion. She has the length, the grappling, and cardio edge, and she just perseveres through adversity better. Miller may have some trouble early in the fight trying to close the distance. I could see Veronica Macedo utilizing that bladed stance and throwing a lot of fast kicks and some counter crosses, using that evasiveness early. But unless Macedo has improved her gas tank, then I just don't see her being able to pot shot and stick and move to victory. Up until now, though, you know, really, Macedo has been kind of like a first round or bust type of fighter. Her win against uh, Viano is a first round armbar, and she tends to slow down majorly, get real sloppy. And if there's anything you could say about Juliana Miller, she's going to push the pace, keep coming. Her striking isn't the greatest, but. She has good pressure durability. She has length. She's improved her hands. Decent kicks from the outside. And she's really just trying to back you up to get in the clinch and take you down. And both these girls are good grapplers. But Miller is just much more tenacious. She's more offensive with her wrestling. She doesn't have great wrestling. But she'll clinch you. She 
wears on you and she's getting better with her entries and finishes and on top she's nasty puts a lot of pressure throws a lot of ground and pound and she has a good submission game and she's an endless gas tank so overall she's a nightmare if she can get momentum and veronica macedo she has okay takedown defense but not the best and off her back she is dangerous she'll look for sweeps arm bars and she's mean i mean she'll crank on the arm and uh try to break it if she can and she really fights with an edge but sometimes you'll see her pull guard and attack submissions to her detriment and she got submitted against Jillian Robertson. She got finished with ground and pound against Ashley Evan Smith. And the most, you know, egregious error in Macedo's game has been her cardio. She tends to start fights strong and then tail off, like I said. So I just feel like skill wise, Macedo is probably superior on the ground. She has the skills to compete also. But I just don't think she's gonna keep that pace. And Miller is a fighter who can come out the fire. She has great cardio. And I, I see Miller struggling, getting lit up a little bit early, but staying tough and then finishing the fight in the second or third round on the ground by submission or TKO. So I'm going to go with Juliana Miller by submission in round two as the official official pick here. Next video, we got Ludwig Klein taking on Jai Herbert. And both these fighters have had inconsistent runs in the UFC. They're coming off impressive performances, though. Jai Herbert, he has won two of his last three. He did lose his first two in the UFC, but he beat Kyle Nelson in a kind of lackluster decision. Hopefully in this fight, he can get back to his usual self because he did have to bounce back from getting knocked out. And Ludovic Klein, he's won two in a row. Got an upset win in his last fight. He actually was a pretty big underdog and got the victory. And he's 3-2 and two in the UFC. He's on a two-fight winning streak. So beating Jai Herbert would kind of cement him as a real lightweight because he's bounced between 145 and 155 and make him a threat to that bottom half of the top 15. But this fight should be competitive. Both fighters are primarily strikers. I expect Ludovic Klein to take the center in this fight, be the fighter walking his opponent down. Herbert's going to try to use his speed, ability to move in and out and counter punch. He is the longer fighter. Klein is southpaw, so I think... He's going to throw a lot of body kicks, and I also think the leg kicks are going to be available. Herbert stands heavy on his lead leg, and Klein should try to put Herbert's back against the fence and then let go with combos clinch, and Jai Herbert should try to use his movement side to side, not stay stationary, pick at Klein's with jabs, crosses, get his range, and then put some power on some shots, and I'll throw more kicks than usual if I were Herbert, see if I can land the high kick, and as far as wrestling goes, Klein has the edge, especially in the cage wrestling against the fence. I don't know if it'd be smart to shoot in on takedowns on Herbert because he does have a solid front choke game. His takedown defense is pretty good, but I do think Klein can hold Herbert against the cage. And if either fighter gets into top position, I think they're probably going to win that round. Cardio-wise, both guys have good cardio and they're dangerous, explosive. They both show knockout ability. They've shown head kick knockouts, so... It's going to be a fun fight, but I'm going to give it to Klein. I think his pressure, his kicks, his cage pushing, clinch work is going to edge him in a decision. I think Klein is more durable, so I trust him in the striking if it becomes more of a war as well. And this fight could play out low volume and very close, so I'm not too interested from a betting perspective, but I'm going to give it to Ludovic Klein to win via decision. Next fight, we got the return of Joe Ann Wood taking on Luana Carolina. And I say the re return of Joanne Wood, but it's actually Luana Carolina who has had a little bit of a longer layoff. But Joanne Wood, she's been a fan favorite for a long time, but she's been up and down in the UFC. She's coming back after 11 months away from competition, and the break was probably not a bad idea. She had lost three fights in a row, and she had a lot of stuff going on outside the cage before a couple of her fights. She got married and things like that, and I think now she's more in fight mode, and she was finishing the first round in her last two fights, but in retrospect, when you look at the losses, it came against Tyler Santos and Alexa Grasso, two of the baddest women in the division. One of them is the champion, so definitely not two losses that are that bad, but she needs a victory here. She's 37, obviously, like I just said, three losses in a row in the twilight of her career, and if she wants to end it on her terms, then this is a fight that she probably has to win. She's been in the gym training hard since the start of the year. She's in good shape, and she should be hyped to be fighting in the UK again. So hopefully those things on top of a step down in competition can bring out that vintage uh, JoJo. But Luana Carolina, she's coming off a devastating knockout loss, but she's facing one of the bigger names in the division. And this is going to be the second fight in a row for Carolina in England. 
She's getting a chance to right the wrong, come back stronger than she did against Molly McCann. And Carolina is 3-2 and two in the UFC. Even though she isn't a big name, she's done fairly well. She's been tasked with fighting some of the better fighters in the division. And she got some okay wins. She beat Priscilla Cachuera. She beat Lupita Godinez. But let's see how she looks on Saturday. I mean, like I said, she's coming off a devastating knockout where she got spitting back elbow KO'd. And it's been over a year. But she's only 29, and I expect her to look pretty similar. And she's very long, lanky Carolina, a Muay Thai fighter. On the feet, she stands tall. She's hittable, but she's tough, aggressive, high volume. Tends to start fights slow, but once she gets going, she'll let go with a lot of nice kicks both with both legs. She has nice leg kicks, front kicks, round kicks. And she has very nice knees. Her hands aren't that good, but with her length, she can sometimes get some pool counters in there and mix in some elbows and she is good in the clinch she'll land some knees elbows but she easily can be taken down from there and she can be held against the cage or striking overall is really not that good if you get inside on her you could touch her chin and she loves to fight though she brings it and you have to take her out to uh, get her to stop coming forward she'll continue to make fights wars if she has to and she tried to turn it up in that third round when she was down 2-0 against McCann I don't know if she's going to have that same fearlessness coming off of a knockout loss, but traditionally that's how she's fought. And her wild and aggressive nature does lend herself to overextending. Her takedown defense when she falls into the clinch or fighter shooting on her is not good. And her grappling is pretty unimpressive. She can pose some problems with her length. Her long legs have created some scrambles, gotten her some submission attempts, but she only has one submission win in her career. And Joanne Wood, whenever she loses, more often than not, it's by first round submission. And I really don't think Carolina has that in her arsenal. Carolina is going to have to try to use her cardio, youthfulness, make it a war, attack the body, and try to open up a knee or head kick that potentially could finish the fight. Honestly, though, stylistically, I think JoJo is a better kicker, better striker, and a uh, better clinch fighter, as well as a better wrestler. So, really, I think it's a tough fight for Carolina, but. With Joanne, she's a great striker. When she comes in on point, she's super active with her distance control, her kicks. She has uh, nice inside-outside leg kicks, oblique kicks. Very nice uh, fast round kicks, front kicks to the body, which I think could be a big factor in this fight. She also throws some snappy high kicks. and She's known for her trademark spinning kick, spinning back fist, and nice left hook, good 3-2 combinations. Her jab isn't bad. She has nasty elbows. And I think she's really improved her boxing. I think in boxing range, she's going to have a sizable advantage. She definitely has the faster, superior hands. And I just think she sets things up better than Carolina with her punches and her kicks or feints. And if she stays sharp defensively, blocks those high kicks, and I think she's going to have a pretty good night if it stays on the feet. And she's worked really hard in her wrestling and her grappling, but it's still been her Achilles heel. She's always had a good clinch game, and that's a big factor here. Whichever girl I think can do better in the clinch is going to come away with a more comprehensive victory. As far as wrestling goes, I think Wood is way better. I think she catches kicks and gets takedowns that way well. She has good body locks. And on top, she's more of a control girl, and she has been submitted in her last two fights and quite a few of her UFC fights. So she does have some issues with either getting hurt and getting submitted where she gives her back like her last fight or getting submitted when she's on top in her opponent's full guard. But I think that Wood probably could get on top and control and smother Carolina. We've seen her do it to other girls like Ariane Lipsky. And I just think she's going to have the grappling edge as well. Unless she falls asleep and falls victim to another submission loss, then I just don't see how Carolina is going to really do much on the ground. Cardio-wise, I think Wood always... Comes in with good cardio. And like I said, I just think it's a tough fight for Carolina. Um, if it weren't for the age difference, I think Wood would be a pretty big favorite. She's going to target the body. I think she could possibly hurt Carolina with some body kicks. And she also has the better hands. If Carolina falls in the clinch, I think Wood will get the better of it there. I think she could even catch some kicks of Carolina, get on top, and control the fight if it starts to get a little kinetic. And she's never one to back down. If it becomes a dog fight, she tends to thrive in those type of situations. And she's never been finished in 23 fights by strikes. And I just see her taking a decision here. I just think she's going to be the veteran. She's going to be more classic composed fighter. And Caroline's a scrapper, but skill-wise, I think Wood is a lot better. I think Wood has the better fight IQ experience edge. 
And I think she could maybe get the TKO, but I'm going to go with the decision win for Joy. And for this next fight, we got Jake Hadley taking on Malcolm Gordon in the flyweight division. Both these guys have produced some pretty fun performances so far. Jake Hadley has had two UFC fights. He had a really good showing in his second UFC performance, and he had a good showing you know, on the Contender Series. And in his first UFC fight, he had a tough fight. He fought against uh, Alad Nascimento, who's a training partner of Charles Oliveira. Fights kind of a similar style and just got out grappled in that fight. Malcolm Gordon, he looked on his way out in the UFC. He got knocked out quickly in his first two fights with the promotion. But he made adjustments and came back strong. He won two UFC fights in a row. Got a first round finish. And even in a loss in his last fight, he had a good showing. He had some good moments against Muhammad Mikhaev And... He's looking to get more than a moral victory this time around, though, and pull the upset. And He's skilled. He's dangerous. He's an action fighter. On the feet, Gordon brings the pressure. He has nice high guard, long arms, fast hands. Good jab, good one-twos down the pipe, and solid kicks. He does a good job of feinting and uh, kind of heading off the cage so he can back fighters up, force them into the pocket. And he's willing to pressure fighters, flurry with heavy punches when they're near the cage. He has fast kicks, nice front kicks. He has okay defense but tends to let shots up the middle come up and hit him like knees front kicks uppercuts hasn't shown a great chin either and early on in fights Gordon has had issues with getting hit cold hurt and the last few fights he's done a better job starting faster but he's gotten rocked or finished in a lot of fights early in the first round he is a black bone jiu-jitsu he has a dangerous submission game wrestling has caused him issues offensive wrestling isn't really a tool he has and defensive wrestling is Something that he's below average at. He tends to overextend and get real wild and give up takedowns too. And his guard is dangerous. If you aren't careful, he'll throw up an arm bar or a triangle. His sweeps aren't bad either. And Muhammad Mikhaib was able to hold him down for the large majority of the fight. And eventually he did submit him. But Gordon was also able to sweep, get on top. He was able to lock in a rear naked choke towards the end of round two that looked pretty tight. And then he even... Took the back again briefly in the third round. But Gordon, he doesn't really get on top of many fights unless he drops or hurt fighters or he could sweep them when they take him down. So tends to be more of a striker. And he does great cardio, but he puts himself in danger of being finished. His takedown defense isn't good. So he has holes, but fighters just have to be careful because Gordon is a good pocket fighter and he has a decent submission game. But Jake Hadley's big for the weight. He can match the size of Gordon. And on the feet, he's a pressure fighter. He has fast hands, power, nice one-twos down the pipe. He has a very technical, clean boxing. His defense is good, high guard. He is a little bit plotty, and he can be susceptible to body shots. But he mixes some fast kicks. He has uh, nice uppercuts, good knees, which I think he's going to have to use in this fight. And he has a power to hurt Gordon if he lands clean. He just needs to be composed and not get in a pocket battle with Gordon and just be a more technical striker in there. And Hadley is a good grappler, solid offensive wrestler. His defensive wrestling is a little questionable. He stands tall and he can be, you know, shot in, get a fighters can get in on him and take him down. But he trains at a good jiu-jitsu gym and it shows off his back. He's very good. He has a good submission game. He can create sweeps. Very, uh, um, very flexible guy. And he did hit a triangle off his back in his last fight. So I do think whenever Hadley loses going forward, it's probably going to be against someone that can hold him down. But he's the better grappler in this one, I think, for MMA. And when he can get on top, he's beastly. Great ground and pound, strong submission game. When he gets to the back, he has good rear naked chokes. And personally, this should be a good match for Hadley. He's a sizable favorite. And I think that his power is going to be an issue for Gordon, especially if he can land early. And it could lead to a club and sub or a TKO finish. And I also think that Hadley has a chance to take Gordon down, tire him out, and then finish him later in the fight. Kind of similar to what Makai have done. So I'll say that Hadley gets a second round submission win in this fight. So on the card here we got the debut of one of the best Cage Warriors champions in a long time. And Christian Leroy Duncan. He's going to be taking on UFC veteran Dusko Todorovic. And for Christian Leroy Duncan... It's a long way to debut for him. I mean, he had an epic career in Cage Warriors. Arguably the best middleweight fighter in Cage Warriors history. He had seven fights as a pro, all of them in Cage Warriors. Six finishes. And not only finishes, man, but highlight reel finishes. His last two fights were 
title fights. He finished one with a flying knee, the other with a spinning elbow. He has a spinning back kick knockout. And as an amateur, he went 17-6. and six, So he's much more experienced than his 7-0 and record indicates. And Dusko Todorovic, he's been up and down. He is essentially a fighter the UFC uses now to test their prospects. And he has won two of three. He did defeat Jordan Wright in October of last year. And overall, he's 3-3 three and three in the UFC. And it seems like whenever he takes a step up in competition, he loses. So far, you know, the three fighters that Todorovic has beaten are lo- no longer in the UFC. And the three fighters he lost to are around the top 15 to 25. So it's a little bit hard to gauge truly where he is because he's either fighting a bottom of the barrel fighter or a fighter that's pretty solid. Um, And this is going to be an interesting one because Christian Leroy Duncan, it's hard to really know where he is in the division. He's very athletic, Christian Leroy Duncan, on the feet. He moves really well, switches stances, does a wide arsenal attack. His hands aren't that great, Duncan's, but his foot speed and his kicks are impressive. And Duncan has good feints, fakes, he throws a lot of front kicks, round kicks. His upper body movement is good. He could pull counter with some hooks and crosses. And his ability to move back out of range is pretty impressive. Kind of reminds me of Cyril Gaon with that. And uh, when he goes southpaw, he likes to throw a lot of lead leg side attacks and lead leg side kicks and a lot of spin kicks. And on the inside, he has some nice elbows. I've seen him land several spinning elbows. And I haven't really seen Duncan in there, though, with the great striker, a pressure boxer yet, and I think that could give him issues. He has these explosions, though, where he can close the distance and touch your chin and put you out. He's dynamic, dangerous, and his wrestling is where he needs to prove the most. Duncan's takedown defense is questionable. He doesn't accept bottom position. He's good at creating scramble and getting back up to his feet. He was able to defeat Will Curry, who's a very strong wrestler and grappler, and Duncan, when he can Reverse and get on top, which he's pretty good at. He has good top control. His ground and pound is vicious. And cardio-wise, he comes in good shape. So he's someone that's tough to grind out. Dusko Todorovic, he's a well-rounded fighter. Recently, he's tried to be more grappling-centric, which I believe he's going to have to do in this fight. But he's also athletic, Todorovic. He likes to pressure more on the feet and primarily use the hands. Fast hands, good job of jabbing or double jabbing his way into the pocket for the right hand. He's at his best when he can get in the pocket and let go with those hooks. He has nice knees on the inside. And I envision in this fight, his game plan is going to be to pressure, try to use the jab to back up Duncan and then take him down against the cage. At range, he has some decent kicks and he could switch stances. But his defense is pretty leaky. He pulls back with his chin in the air. And I think he could possibly be clipped by a flashy attack if he just stays on the outside for Todorovic um if you can get Duncan against the cage he is pretty effective with uh holding guys in the clinch and he has okay wrestling against the cage he did get taken down his last fight against Jordan Wright which is a little bit alarming but grappling wise he probably has the edge I think Duncan can uh probably defend a lot of the takedowns though if Todorovic does get on top that's his best chance to win he has a decent submission game, but I would just worry about trying to control and grind Duncan out. Cardio-wise, Todorovic, he can push a high pace. and His last fight, he gassed out Jordan Wright and then finished him. But I think that Dusko has a chance to win this fight just because Duncan has suspect wrestling and kind of below average hands. But, you know, I just think Duncan, if he fights with full capabilities, he's too skillful, he's too smart. And when Duncan gets on top, he's going to stay on top. He's not going to make mistakes that Dorovic does to lose position. On the feed, I think Duncan is the better striker. He's bigger, longer, faster, more athletic. As far as a bet goes, I have to pass. I just don't trust Dorovic at all. But Duncan is also unproven. He's a decent favorite, and I just don't think he's worth the risk. So as an official pick, I'm going to pick Christian Leroy Duncan by second-round TKO. But I think Dorovic... um, it's probably going to let him slip an elbow in there that knocks him out or hurts him and then allows Duncan to fall up and finish the fight. But it's a fight I would just watch, pass, and then kind of monitor where I think Duncan is after this fight. So for me, it's Duncan, but this is one of these fights that I'm not super confident on. And this next fight, this is an awesome fight here. I'm looking forward to this one. Leron Murphy versus Gabriel Santos. Leron Murphy is undefeated, and he probably should be fighting a bigger name opponent. He originally was scheduled to fight Nate Landwehr. And then he was going to fight Nathaniel Wood. I think it was both on different cards, but 
Both fighters couldn't make it to the fight, and Murphy really wanted to fight in his home country, so he decided to jump on this card and take on a UFC newcomer, even though he's already unbeaten through four UFC fights. I mean, it's a big risk for Murphy, but the way he's been looking lately, I'm sure he's confident. Hasn't fought in a while either, so maybe he just needs to get in there and uh, get the job done. It's been almost a year and a half since he's fought. And he had a tough test getting through a veteran in Douglas Silva de Andrade. And then in his last fight, he knocked out a good grappler in Mako Namir Khani. So 31 years old, it's a small worry with the layoff, but he has been looking really good. And Gabriel Santos, he stamped himself as one of the best Brazilian prospects, in my opinion, in January when he took out another really good Brazilian fighter in Jose Delano to win the LFA title. And now he's getting his shot in the UFC. He's 26 years old. Fighting out of a really good gym in Evolucao Muay Thai. He's undefeated at 10-0. And he's been fighting some high-level competition. He's taken out most of them as well. This is going to be his first fight outside of Brazil. And by far the biggest stage he's ever been on. All the lights are on. So it's time to see if Santos is going to shine or dimmer. But he's already won a title in a pretty major promotion. And he's definitely ready for this moment. For Laurent Murphy, he's an explosive power puncher. Wide bladed stance, likes to bounce in and out of range, uh, can switch stances, pretty light on his feet. In this fight, I think he has to get on the calf kicks early. He has good calf kicks and needs to up the volume with them in this fight because Santos is going to be coming with that pressure and heat. And Murphy has big power in his right cross. He has nice jab, double jab twos. Sometimes he can get a little bit wild, throw big overhands and really get wide. And he's still a little bit green in my opinion. But his athleticism and power make up for a lot of his deficiencies. And the speed and volume is going to be on the side of Santos. So Murphy must level the playing field with his leg kicks and then utilize that power. And Laurent Murphy is not a wrestler or a grappler. But he's proven to be proficient in those areas. Sometimes he will look for takedowns. I don't think he's going to do that in this fight. But his takedown defense is okay. He's hard to hold down though. And his ability to reverse and get on top and then throw thunderous ground and pound has been shown in multiple fights and he knocked out a couple fighters from the top position so when he gets on top of you that's a bad spot to be in and he does tend to give his back though and if he gets taken down by santos he could be in for a tough time cardio wise murphy is well conditioned he could push a high pace for his opponent gabriel santos pressure fighter he has aggressive striking stands tall marches guys down behind the jab the one twos big right hands good body puncher he um does a good job of finding that liver that's how he finished his last fight and he has fast kicks with the rear leg to all parts of the body stays very active with the kicks on the outside when fighters get on the inside he has nice spinning attacks he'll look for the counter hooks his hands are fast but in the pocket is somewhere where it's going to be real interesting he's a good brawler but it's very dangerous in this fight against a power puncher like murphy and Santos does stand heavy on his lead leg. He's had issues with leg kick defense, so that's something that Laurent Murphy could also pinpoint. I have seen Santos dropped before in fights and kind of get caught getting out of position attacking uh, with spinning attacks, but he came back to win, so he's super tough and durable, and he can battle through really bad adversity. He's improving his striking as well. His last fight, he was switching stances. He was much more composed. And he's improving his hands. He's using his defense a lot better as well. He used to have a tendency to drop his hands. His guard is a lot better now. His head movement still isn't great. And that's why Murphy has a chance to clip him in this fight. But I do think Santos is the better overall striker. He's going to be faster throwing a more diversity of strikes. Higher volume of strikes. And Gabriel Santos is probably going to try to get this fight to the ground as well. He's He is a, isn't a great wrestler, but he's strong, athletic. And when he... Backs first to the fence, he'll shoot in and get it, get in on the takedowns. When he gets it to the ground, he's an elite grappler. He has tremendous control, very aggressive with his, with his passing. His back takes are extremely fast, great back control. He'll attack arm bars and rear naked chokes. And uh, usually he finishes fights when he gets to the back. And when he gets on top against any opponent, they're in submission danger. And probably at minimum going to lose that round. He's very fast twitch. But he's proven he can go five rounds. His cardio is good. He could push a super high pace. And I'm going to go with the upset here. I'm going to go with Gabriel Santos. I'm a Leron Murphy fan. And he has a puncher's chance in any fight. But in this fight, unless he can get his leg kicks going early, 
I just think the pressure, the volume, the speed, the kicking and punching technique of Santos, his ability to hit the takedowns is better. Grappling, his back control are all some things that he could use against Murphy to win the fight. I also like the fact that he just fought in January. He won as an underdog in a fight for a title in a pretty big pressure spot. Laurent Murphy he hasn't fought in a year and a half. He, like I said, is a little older, 31 years old. Um, so I just think Santos, as an underdog, has a really good shot to pull the upset here. And I'm going to pick him to win via decision. I think he's just going to be a little bit more diverse, a little bit higher volume, and be the superior fighter in this matchup. And this next fight, we got the return of one of the biggest prospects in the UFC today, Muhammad Mikhaev. And he's right now probably the biggest threat to John Joe's record of being the youngest champion. He's 22 years old. He's 3-0 in the UFC. And he's 23-0 overall. He's unbeaten in nine pro fights. And you would think that he's ready for a ranked opposition or a step up in competition. But the UFC, I think after they saw his last performance, probably pumped the brakes a little bit. He largely dominated Malcolm Gordon, but there were a few moments where he was putting some bad spots, and I think the matchmaker saw that, and that's why he isn't getting a ranked fighter here. And I think probably a lot of people are ducking him as well. But obviously, there's no rush, so it isn't a big deal. And Philo isn't a pushover or anything. And if Makaev wants to be a champion, though, before he's 23 years old in eight months, he definitely has to get going. He only has about a year to do it. And um, he has to run through Philo here get a win against another high-level fighter and then try to get that title shot in there or something. But uh, Mount Mikhaev, wrestler, he holds his hands really low on the feet and is pretty dynamic with the stand-up, almost baits guys in to try to chase them. And then he'll use that evasiveness to throw counter hooks, pull twos, flying knees. He throws a lot of kicks on the outside, uh, some nice spin kicks. Um, but I don't think his striking is that great. I mean, a fighter who can get in and pressure... Makai have maintained distance and defend the takedowns is going to beat him up. But right now, you know, he's essentially a guy that likes to use his movement to stay away, counter, get fighters to chase or overextend, and then it also explode in with big actions to try to create opportunities to hit takedowns. And when he gets on top, I mean, his top pressure is his ability to attack chokes, his ability to mat return, his cardio is all elite. Um, his last fight, he had some bad sequences, but... Obviously, he ended up getting the submission in the third round. And the one thing he just needs to improve with is his ground and pound. He doesn't have the best ground and pound right now. isn't very active with it. And I think if he throws more ground and pound, he can open more finishes up. But uh, Philo is a guy that has really good back control. So Makayev, who gave his back a couple times in his last fight, can't afford to do that here. And his submission defense looks a little shaky on the back too. So he can't give his back to Philo or we could be seeing a big upset. But... If Makayev, you know, uses his wrestling and his evasive striking, he's probably going to have an easy night. And uh, Philo, he's making his debut here, but getting fed to the Wolves, obviously. Huge underdog, but he's 14-2, and two, coming out of Novu and Yao. Still relatively unknown. Earned his contract via the Contender Series last year. And this is going to be his first, uh, second fight outside of Brazil. And he's fought some good opponents, but... Most of his wins are against lesser competition. He's only one, fought one non-Brazilian fighter. And Makaev is the first wrestler who Jafil Filo is ever going to have fought. But Filo is an aggressive grappler. On the feet, he stands tall. He is low volume but powerful when he lets his hands go. Long bladed stance and tries to feint, bounce in and out, back fighters up so he can take him down. And He's a little bit slow, but he does have power in his hands. Decent jab, three twos. He has nice combos when he lets his hands go, but he can struggle to get into range to punch against movers, and he throws a lot of kicks, some nice body kicks, leg kicks, and I don't know if those kicks are going to be something he's going to be able to use in this fight because of the takedown threat, but, you know, Philo, if he can connect on a big left hook or 3-2, he definitely has the power to hurt Makayev, and he likes to pressure and then shoot in on the cage, and he has decent body lock, but... I don't see him taking down taking down Makayev in this fight. And his defensive wrestling, from what I've seen, is okay. I mean, I've seen him use a good sprawl. I've seen him threaten the neck when guys shooting on him. And on the ground, he's a beast. I mean, his scrambling is pretty top-notch. He has fast back takes. When he gets to that back, he's super hard to shake off. And he's comfortable. I mean, you've seen him inviting, playing off of his back. But in this match, I think that would be a mistake. You've I've seen also in fights where... He is getting the lesser of the striking and starts to 
panic wrestle, shoot really bad takedowns, pull guard, get tired. And he's he's only been finished um, twice in 16 fights, but both his losses are finished losses. I think Makai probably takes a decision here with this heavy wrestling style. Maybe a late submission, but uh, unless he can catch him with something early like he did with Durden, like a shot, crazy strike, I don't think he's going to knock him out. And um, I think Philo is good on the ground, so it's going to be tough to submit him. But I'm going to pick Makayev to move around, hit the takedowns, and uh, grind out another victory for himself here. And for this next fight, we got two fighters making their UFC debut with Sam Patterson and Yanal Ashmos. And Sam Patterson is going to be welcoming Yanal Ashmos to England. He earned his contract by way of the Contender Series last September. Got a second round submission win, which put him on a six fight winning streak, gave him this UFC roster spot. Overall, Patterson is 10 1 1. He hasn't lost since the second pro bout in 2017. He's fought good competition too. He has wins over fighters like Felipe Silva, who fought in the UFC, former PFL fighter and Brave CF champion, Ease Dilgurin, and the 14 1 Camille, uh, Camille Magomedov. Before coming to the UFC, Patterson was fighting in the Middle East for Brave CF and he actually won the belt for Brave, so this will be his first fight in England in over four years. And for you know Ashmos, he's joining Nathan Levy in the UFC as the only other Israeli-born fighter to compete. And he's 6-0, he's undefeated. Currently, he's fighting out of the K-Dojo -Dojo Warrior Tribe in New Jersey. After having his first three pro bouts in Israel, he came to the United States and settled there in uh, New Jersey. And K-Dojo Warrior, Warrior Tribe is a really interesting gym because you look at who's who trains there, and you'd think it'd be in a, a gym in Russia. Almost all their top athletes are Russian fighters who have migrated to the United States. And he's had three fights since coming to the States, two were C for CFFC and Ring of Combat, which are two of the premier and recognizable Northeast promotions. His last fight was for the PFL Challenger Series in Florida. And that win, along with his style, um, gave the UFC... A reason to call him and give him this chance for Saturday. And for Yanosh, know, most style-wise, he's a beast. I mean, he's not the most technical fighter, but he's extremely powerful. He's explosive, comes well-conditioned. On the feet, on the outside, he throws some really fast kicks. He has nice kicks to all parts of the body. As far as the hands go, he really just throws a lot of hooks, uppercuts, overhands. When fighters pressure, he will move side to side, look to fake the level changes, then come with big overhands and hooks. And... He'll try to rip the body too. And um, his boxing is not that good though. When you can get him in the pocket, you can really pick him apart. He will just try to land wing shots. And he does have nice kicks on the outside though. He'll, like I said, throw real fast kicks. And um, that's going to be something that he could use in this fight. And I think that his ability to close the gap and catch Patterson is going to be something that he has to used to his advantage here because Patterson's a little bit stiff and awkward backing out of range sometimes and Ashmos has that killer instinct when he hurts you he swarms and can finish you and his wrestling is a little bit questionable but he's a good grappler he's hard to hold down when he gets taken down he can reverse position and get on top and when he gets on top he has really good ground and pound and his last fight he was hitting some body lock takedowns and seems like he's getting a little bit better with his clinch game and his offensive wrestling against the cage and he definitely has good cardio he could push the pace his opponent sam patterson is a massive lightweight he's 6 3 78 inch reach i think he has the longest reach in the division and he doesn't really use his reach that well but he's improving with that he's getting better with using his jabs his front kicks he'll throw the left hook out there inside he'll throw some sloppy hooks and the issue with patterson striking to me is the fact that he just doesn't do the best job of countering and he doesn't do the best job of retreating out of range. He can get hit as he backs up. And he doesn't really have the ability to counter with his hands to make fighters pay to pressure him. And his length and toughness when he can go forward do make him dangerous though. Because he can use those front kicks, keep you at bay, and just kind of pick you apart. And he has great composure and volume. So he can absorb shots and keep coming and kind of break you down. And if he fights smart, uses his kicks as long punches... He can beat up Ashmos. He just has to stay away from those bombs. And Patterson, his takedown defense is questionable, but he has good front chokes, and he has a decent clinch game. Um, I think he's going to have to figure out how to get Ashmos off of him, though, and back off the fence and off the floor and try to make his striking battle and have the best chance to win. 
I I see Asmos trying to pressure Patterson, get him to the fence, and mix in some takedowns, get on top. And if he can take Patterson down, I think Patterson's going to be in some trouble. Patterson has also had some trouble starting fights slow. He's gotten dropped in the first round. He got dropped in the first round of his last fight. He got knocked out in the first round of his loss. So I do believe Ashmans has a chance to knock him out. I think the line is off. Both fighters are green. I think Patterson's length and technical striking combinations with his pressure and pace could give Ashmos issues. But I also think issues issues from Ashmos that he could pose to Patterson could be his ability to catch him as he moves backwards and potentially hold him against the cage and take him down. But I'm going to edge the fight towards Sam Patterson. I'm going to say he gets out of those early stages, finds his range, shuts down the wrestling, gets the better of the clinch exchanges and pick, picks at Ashmos and route to a decision victory. Um, so it's one of these fights I would totally stay away from though. I feel like if you were to bet on it, it's definitely a dog or pass, but I'm going to go Sam Patterson by decision is my official pick. And this next fight, this should be a fun striking fight here with Chris Duncan taking on Omar Morales. And this is going to be the UFC debut for Chris Duncan. He's had to make it the hard way. He had his first fight in 2014. And since going pro, he tested himself against fighters with good records. He fought in Bellator. He went 3-0 and there. And those fights got him to call to come on the Contender Series in 2021. But unfortunately for Duncan, he got knocked out in that fight. Went back on the regional scene, got another win, and then the UFC called him back to fight on the Contender Series in August of last year again. This time, Duncan got a knockout win of his own in the first round in a really wild fight. And he was going to fight Michael Figlak in this one, but Figlak pulled out, and now he's tasked with facing a more tenured UFC fighter in Omar Morales. It isn't that short notice, though, as Morales had about five weeks to prepare. And Duncan had a camp at American Top Team again for this one, so probably he's going to be ready to go. Omar Morales, he's been up and down, and this is definitely the tail end of his career to me. He's 37 years old, and overall he's 11-3, and but he's 3-3 and in the UFC, and he's lost two fights in a row. His last fight, he got knocked out, and he hasn't fought in quite a while, so it's going to be interesting to see how he bounces back from that. But Chris Duncan, tough, hard-nosed fighter. On the feet, Duncan is super hittable, and he's a bit of a punching bag, but He's heavy-handed, and he likes to pressure forward in a range, look for the three twos. He's dangerous in the pocket. He has a power right hand. His last fight, he did get rocked. He was on the brink of getting knocked out, but he landed a nasty cross on the retreat that knocked Charlie Campbell out cold, and he throws pretty good kicks to both the legs and the body. He doesn't really move his head, stands very heavy on the lead leg, and he's there to be hit. He's taking a lot of damage, and uppercuts have been right on the money for his opponents. He stands square, and he's just asking to be knocked out, but he's very durable, heavy-handed himself, and if you get in the pocket with him, he's a good pocket fighter, and his kicks are decent on the outside, so he has a danger factor of his own, and he's an okay grappler. He doesn't have the best wrestling. He only tends to wrestle when he's getting beat up on the feet, but he has okay timing on the double legs. His ground game isn't great, but he has okay control, and he has underrated ground and pound. I think in this fight, it would be smart for Duncan to put... Omar Morales on the cage, clinch him, make him defend takedowns, and even if you can't hold him down, try to gas him out if you can. And Duncan's score stance and pressure does make his takedown defense questionable. In this fight, I feel it probably won't have to, you know, rear its head. I don't think Morales is going to really go for takedowns. But cardio, that's one thing where Duncan has a big edge in this fight. Cardio is one of his main weapons, and I think he's going to want to push the pace here. Omar Morales, he's a low-volume kickboxer. I think leg kicks are going to be his path to victory. He has nice calf kicks. I think he has to land those to mitigate the pressure of Duncan. Omar Morales has decent hands, but he doesn't throw them nearly enough. His jab is okay. He throws one twos, three twos. In this fight, I think he has to take more of a stand and throw more volume and sit down on shots. But historically, he hasn't shown power in his hands. He only has two knockouts. Both are with kicks. One with the high kick. One with the leg kick. But I will say his last fight, he was more aggressive. He was sitting down, throwing pool twos. He was looking for the head kicks more. And it led him being knocked out. So I don't know if he's going to replicate that game plan. But um, I think that would be smart to do here against Duncan to be with that same aggressive style. Omar Morales has a black belt. And he has underrated grappling. His wrestling is okay too. Clinch takedowns. But... He doesn't have good top control, and I don't see him holding Duncan down. I don't think it's worth 
the cardio output to try to wrestle for Morales. So takedowns are not something I would incorporate. And it's hard to know how Morales is going to come back here or how, where his head is at. He hasn't won a fight in two years, coming off two finishes in a row, two finished losses in a row. 37 years old. He's having to travel to England to fight a UK fighter. And this fight's a tough one. Just because Chris Tucker is so hittable, there is a world where Morales can jab and left hook or leg kick and move his way to a win or even get the knockout. Um, but I think that Morales doesn't have the power or cardio to deal with Duncan's pressure and pace. If he can't hurt his legs and slow him down early, Duncan is a good offensive striker. And if he can get into the pocket, I think he can wear the damage better than Morales. Morales' cardio for me is a big question mark, especially with the layoff, with him being older, him already showing bad cardio in previous fights and having to travel now uh, abroad. I'm confident Chris Duncan can win this fight. Um, I'm going to pick him to win via third round KO TKO, but it's just Duncan isn't that skilled, so obviously Morales is the more skillful fighter. And If he turns up 100%, then he probably will get the victory, but... I just think with the intangibles, with the age, not fighting in 10 months, with having to travel overseas, with having questionable cardio, questionable durability, coming off a knockout loss, I got to go with Chris Duncan here, and I'm going to pick him to win via third round knockout. And closing out the prelims, we got Jack Shore versus Makwan Amir Khani. And Jack Shore is making a return to 145 pounds. He's looking to bounce back after a, a loss last year to Ricky Simone. And coming back from losses is part of the game, but for Jack Shore, he had never experienced defeat going into his last fight. He had won 28 fights in a row, dating back to his amateur career, was 16-0 as a pro. And hopefully he has a good support system and he's mentally prepared coming into this fight. And he did decide to mix it up and he's moving up to 145 pounds. He hasn't fought in a while and he did have seven pro fights at featherweight, so... I don't think it's going to be that big of an issue for him. And I know that he did have a fight scheduled against Kyler Phillips last year at 135, but had a knee injury, pulled out. And I don't know if it was a case of him gaining weight by being injured or wanting to fight in the UK and um, only being able to fight a 145er. But I don't know if he's planning to move to 145 permanently or this is a one-off. But uh, Mach 1 Amir Khan, he's a fighter coming off a couple losses in a row and Lost four or five, so I'm sure Shore feels pretty confident he can go in there and do the business. And Makwan, he's hanging on to his UFC career by a thread. He's in a must-win scenario on Saturday. His last two fights and four of his last five, he just did not perform well. And skill-wise, we've seen what Amir, Amir Khani could do. He's dangerous. Seven UFC wins. He has some early finishes. It's just he has a huge hole in the cardio department, and fighters have seemingly figured out how to deal with this style. So at UFC 286, Amir Khani, he is taking on a guy that's moving from 135 to 145. So he's probably going to be a little bit bigger than him. And um, it's maybe a good time to catch Jack Shore coming off the first loss of his career. And Amir, Amir Khani might get the upset. But personally, I think it's a really difficult matchup. And Jack Shore is a big favorite for a reason. When you look at Amir Khani on the feet he really doesn't offer too much early on he does have that explosiveness factor where he can close the distance and we've seen him throw those flying knees and catch guys early and then catch him in the front chokes but uh you know now that guys have seen that early on in the fight I think it's gonna be really hard for him to land that type of attack and um long term on the feet he has okay footwork and movement but he really only uses the jab he doesn't have power very hittable guy, kind of really s below average striking, if you ask me. And his wrestling is really good. I mean, he has great timing. He could take you down and hold you down. And early in that first round when he has great cardio, he can attack those front chokes. And he has a lot of different type of front chokes he can finish with and has submitted a lot of guys. But if he can't get you out of there early, his gas tank has just really not been there for him in recent fights. And He's a tough dude. I mean, we saw him go all three rounds against Edson Barbosa, get dropped a lot of times, but uh, definitely doesn't weather the storm or doesn't have the ability to uh, keep that same pressure if fighters weather his storm and slows down majorly. At 34 years old, I don't see that really changing. For Jack Shore, he's way better on the feet. He has really good footwork. He has a nice jab, fast hands. I think he has some of... Uh, the most underrated boxing and footwork in uh, the UFC. And 
he's a pretty decent striker. He just doesn't have that power or high level athleticism. And then his defensive wrestling is a little questionable. That's what we saw really, you know, lose him the fight against Ricky Simone. He got taken down and dominated on the ground, eventually got submitted. But he is a good grappler himself. I don't think that Maquan's going to have that ability to just big brother him like Ricky Simone did. And Jack Shore has good offensive wrestling. And when he can get to the back, he's very good at finishing from there as well. So I just feel as if potentially Maquan could hit a takedown or two. But Shore is not going to accept that bottom position. He's going to make Maquan work. And eventually he's going to start to get his striking going. I think he's going to start to back up Maquan, touch him up, get Maquan to start shooting some bad takedowns. And I think he's going to end up exposing his back to Jack Shore, Maquan Amir Khani, and getting submitted either in that second or third round. So I'm going to go with Jack Shore via second round submission. And kicking on the card, we got a potentially explosive fight in the middleweight division with Marvin Vittori and Roman DeLeeds. And Marvin Vittori is still on the quest for UFC gold. He's been hovering around the title for years now. In the last six years, he's only lost to two guys, former champions, Israel Adesanya and Robert Whitaker. But this is definitely a pivotal fight for him because he's coming off of a loss and he can't lose to a guy below him in the rankings if he wants to have a chance at the title anytime soon. Roman DeLeeds is ranked 8th, Marvin is 4th, and a loss to DeLeeds would make it 3 losses in Vittori's last 4 fights. So I'm sure Vittori has gotten some renewed vigor as well after seeing Israel lose the belt. And he just has to use that motivation and get back in the win column. For Roman DeLeeds, he's... Taken middleweight by storm, he's won five of his last six fights since dropping down in weight. His last three fights especially have been fantastic, and this is going to be his third fight in five months. And he's finished three opponents in a row. His last fight was his best win. He took out Jack Hermanson, and now he's getting his opportunity to jump into the top five. And he's trained his last few fights in Vegas, but for this one, he's gone out to Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand, and now... Marvin is training in Vegas, so that's a bit in an interesting wrinkle to take into account. I don't know if they're training with the same people, but I'm sure um, Marvin might have gotten a little bit of insight from some guys about Roman. But um, when you're looking at this matchup, I think it's an interesting one because Marvin, we know what he's going to do. He's a guy that likes to pressure, uses cardio and pace as an advantage. He has pretty good boxing. He's, you know very very durable so he could take shots and then he wants to take you down get on top of you use his ground and pound to open up submissions and eventually finish you and if he can't finish you he can grind you out for three or five rounds so he's a guy that's uh, tough to deal with but we've seen people that can use their speed kind of stick and move on him and um keep him at bay have been able to really beat him up we saw robert whitaker really put it on him in his last fight and you have to kind of wonder mentally what that did to Vittori because he was extremely confident going into that fight and kind of got humbled. So hopefully he could summon it up and, you know, be that old Vittori that we're used to seeing in this deletes fight. But the main advantages that he has in this fight, in my opinion, are his cardio and his volume on the feet. I think that he needs to try to pressure, try to stay in Roman Deleuze's face to try to make Roman not be able to use those blitzes and get him on the back foot where he can explode in and catch him with something wild. And maybe at the end of the round, mix in some takedowns or once he sees Roman fading, mix in some takedowns because Roman on the ground is tough to deal with, man. And you know Vittori is probably working a lot on leg lock defense and a lot of um, you know leg entanglements and how to be safe in those areas. And but it's going to be tough to deal with a guy like Roman Deleuze, who's very just adept at that, a former ADCC champion and everything like that. So Marvin just has to be on his P's and Q's on the ground. But we've also seen guys like John Alon. We've seen guys like Trevin Giles even be able to defend a little bit of the uh, ground attack and beat up Roman with some ground and pound. So Marvin has that same potential as well. And for Roman Deleuze, he's a guy that on the feet, he's low volume, but when he lets go, he's super powerful, explosive. He's very fast, too, and he's someone that can close the distance really quickly, and he, his hands are really powerful and quick. So he can close that gap and touch Marvin with some hooks that he doesn't see. Maybe he could be the first guy to hurt Marvin and get him out of there, but obviously that's a tough ask. And Roman, he also has decent head kicks and kicks from the outside, but his last fight, you could tell like when he fought someone that had good movement and footwork and wasn't 
staying there for him to explode into. He really struggled to get really any meaningful offense off on the feed, and Jack Hermanson pretty much dominated the majority of the striking. But when Roman can get in there on the inside, when he can get you against the fence, he'll throw some big, heavy uh, knees. He uh, dropped Kyle Dawkins there, and he's just a dangerous guy if he can touch your chin on the feet. And he's shown that on the ground he's super elite, man. He has that ability to uh, kind of chain submissions together. Like his last fight, we saw him attack the arm and then use that to create the um, opportunity to trap that leg, sweep her Manson, and finish him with the ground and pound. And we've seen him kind of really hurt um, Phil Haas' leg with the leg attack and then knock him out. And Roman, if you take him down, you just have to be very aware that he's going to be attacking the legs. He's going to be going for submissions and sweeps. And if he gets on top of you, you're going to be in trouble. So just stay heavy on top, grind him out. And Roman, you know, I don't really necessarily think he has the cardio to compete with Marvin. I don't think he has the volume. And I think he's going to be having to rely on a finish or having to rely on uh, something like his last fight where he can get a sweep and ground and pound or submission off his back or a knockout. But... I think long-term, Marvin just is a little bit too skilled for him on the feet with the boxing, a little bit too skilled for him in the wrestling. He has the cardio advantage and the uh, youth advantage. He has the experience advantage against the superior fighters. So I'm going to go through the Tory via decision in this fight. And up next, we got Jennifer Maya taking on Casey O'Neill in a woman's 125-pound fight. Jennifer Maya, she's been the definition of up and down in the UFC. She's 5-5 five and five in 10 fights, but... She still established herself as one of the best gatekeepers in the division and beating Jennifer Maya definitely means something and she still has aspirations of another run herself. She's coming off of a win at 34 years old. She's done it all. She's seen it all. She's a longtime Invicta FC champion. She competed for the UFC title. She fought the who's who of the division. Her last fight, she got the upset over Marina Moroz, who was on a big win streak and now Maya's looking to make an even bigger statement defeat the undefeated young prospect Casey O'Neill and Casey O'Neill she's a brash 25 year old fighter she's coming out of Scotland she trained in a ton of gyms all over the world but she's settled in extreme couture now and she's gone 9-0 and as a pro and she's won 13 fights in a row after starting 4-0 in the UFC she beat Roxanne Modafari and she's riding a wave of momentum she's finally getting a top 10 opponent here unfortunately for O'Neal an ACL injury in that Roxanne fight sidelined her for over a year and I'm sure it's frustrating to see fighters move on and girls like Aaron Blanchfield and Alexa Grasso emerge as the potential future of the division but it's also has to be exciting I mean Neil now it's now it's O'Neal's chance to uh remind everyone that she's also a name to potentially be remembered up there and her opponent by far the best and prime fighter that she's fought to date so coming off a layoff, coming off a knee surgery, this is a tough ask and would be a big win for her. Casey O'Neill, she's uh, tall, long, and lanky. Her last fight was the first fight where she really showcased her ability to strike and use her range better. It was against a low-level striker in Roxanne Modafari, but the fight was fun and O'Neill threw a ton of volume. She had solid combinations. In this fight, she's going to have a 5-inch reach advantage and she must use that to set up her takedowns and not shoot blind. Casey O'Neill, she brings that constant pressure. She's improving her hands, her jab, her one twos, or three twos. She throws a nice overhand right, and she'll let go with a lot of kicks with both legs. Her leg kicks, front kicks, round kicks, and um, head kicks stay popping. And she does a good job mixing up the target of her punch and uh, kick combination. She'll go to the body. Defensively, she is hittable. She doesn't move her head. She comes forward and backwards in straight line. She doesn't really use feints. And someone that's a good counter puncher is definitely going to be able to beat her up and stick and move with overhands, crosses, and give her a lot of issues. And she does have that ability to take some to give some. And if you want to have that game plan versus O'Neal, you have to have the power to keep her honest or she's going to keep coming and try to push that pace on you. And she's a very good grappler. Her wrestling is a little questionable. She was taken down and lost the first round against Laura Procopio. She got taken down a couple times against Roxanne. And O'Neal's straightforward attack makes it easy for fighters to time takedowns on her and get in on the legs. She does have heavy hips, good balance, and can stuff takedowns to get on top. And um, that makes a lot of fighters hesitant to try to take her down. But sometimes if she throws a kick or off-balances herself, she also can end up on her back. And on bottom, she's super active. 
She's a great guard. She'll throw up a lot of submissions, elbows, try to create sweeps. So that's why she's so willing to throw a lot of kicks on the feet. I don't think she's worried about going to her back. And when she can get on top, she's a beast. She, her wrestling is solid. And she doesn't have the best entries, but she'll use the single or the double leg to come up into the body lock, use her length and her strength to get the takedown. And when she gets on top, she has good ground and pound, endless cardio, and tends to do damage, chip away, and then get late finishes. Before O'Neal's last last fight, she had four finishes in a row, and three in the second round, one in the third. And in this fight, she needs to use her mo mobility, kicks, length, try to stay out of boxing range, and then get the takedowns if she can. And if O'Neal can get on top of anyone in the division, I think she can go to work, have success, wear on them. And O'Neal's on a 13-fight win streak. She's extremely confident. Sometimes that's the biggest weapon you can bring into the cage, your mentality. So this is the biggest test of her career. And we're going to see if she's going to become a true contender after this fight. But Jennifer Maya is underrated. She's no joke. I feel like I say this every time she fights. But she is some of the most underrated and arguably is one of the best boxers in that division. And she's improved her footwork. She has good bounce, good distance control. Good job of moving in and out of range, controlling the center. Good feints, and she feints more than O'Neal. Good job of moving her head while she pressures. And she has a nasty jab, really good at jabbing or double jabbing her way in for the right cross. She also will throw a jab to left hook combination. Her hands are fast, and she has fast counters. When she can back fighters up towards the fence, she'll flurry in with punch combinations. She isn't a big kicker, but she has decent leg kicks, and she did land a pretty nice high kick on Manon Firo. And Maya sometimes gets struggled to work away inside against tall fighters that can kick and move. And Manon Firo did lay the blueprint that Casey O'Neill needs to follow. She was able to keep Maya at bay with kicks and check hooks and didn't stick in the pocket. If Maya can get into boxing range and start to back O'Neill up or pick her off the jab in the counter two, she's going to beat her up. She Casey O'Neill cannot box in this fight. She has to stay long, beat all the way out and all the way in. And Jennifer Maya, she's a strong girl, solid grappler. In the clinch against the cage, she has good control. She can hold fighters there and bank rounds. And her last few fights, she's shown wrestling improvements as well. Good singles, nice trips. When she's on top, she's heavy. She can control the position, but she doesn't really do a lot of offense. And her takedown defense is good. In this fight, she's going to have to have her takedown defense on point. Not let O'Neal get her to the ground because O'Neal could change the tide of the fight. And Maya has had some losses where... She got taken down, but she is active off her back. She'll look for submissions, basically just to try to create scambles to stand up. But she did catch uh, Joanne Calderwood in an arm bar. If fighters can take down Maya and just stay heavy and full guard, they can hold her down, though. And I could see Casey O'Neill coming in with that game plan. But Maya has great cardio, super tough, never been finished. And she's a tough out for anyone. And for Jennifer Maya, I think she's trying to pressure, use the jab, feints to get Casey to throw, pull counter. I think the pull overhand, the pull right cross are going to be money for Maya in this fight. And if she can control distance the way she wants, I think she could really outbox Casey. I also think that Maya could have success clinching against the cage, maybe getting some takedowns. And I think she should try to wrestle when it's short time in the round because the worst position for Maya to be is on her back in this fight. Casey O'Neill, she's going to have to figure out how to get her kicking game and jab game uh, and check hook game kind of going without getting clipped with the right hand. And ideally, O'Neill wants to be competitive in the striking enough to get the body lock. And I think she may struggle to get takedowns if she can't at least be a threat on the feet. So she has to kind of stamp herself that she can land some kicks and some shots early to get some takedowns. And her game plan, though, is definitely going to be to clinch, get on top, where she could control and beat Maya up. And if she can get on top of Maya, I think she could probably wear on her, get her tired, and take over the fight. Um, but I'm pretty impressed with how Jennifer Maya has been improving, even at her older age and deepening into her career. She's coming in better shape. She has her weight cut issues under control. Her boxing and her wrestling have clearly improved. And I'm going to take Maya here to give Casey O'Neill a bit of a vet lesson. I think that Casey O'Neill, you know, I don't know what she's been doing during her knee rehab and if her striking will have leveled up. But personally, from what I saw in the Rock Sand fight and some of her others, I think that Maya, she can use her footwork to pull counter and use her boxing like she did in her last fight. She can win. I don't see Maya wilting and getting tired or being easy to finish when she's taken down. So if she gets taken down, she just needs to stay composed, try to maybe get back up to her feet. But even if she can't, know that she has two more rounds to work. And 
I don't think she's going to be taken down, but if she does, I do see her being able to stay calm, maybe use a half guard sweep or leg attack to get back up to her feet, or maybe drop that round, like I said, come back for the next one. And Casey O'Neill is a fighter who I think could be a future contender. She brings in tangibles like aggressiveness, mindset, and the edge that most girls can't compete with. And you couple that with her strength and her conditioning. Once she gets some more experience and skills on the feet, I think she could be a handful for anyone. But right now I'm going to pick Jennifer Maya to get the upset here and win via 29-28 decision. And this next fight, this is going to be a fun one. Gunnar Nelson versus Brian Barberina. Two guys that have been in the UFC for a long time. They put on some bangers and now we're going to see them matched up against each other. Kind of a contrast of styles too with Barberina being a pressure fighter. A guy that has some of the better inside fighting in the welterweight division and some really good uh, power, not power necessarily, but really good volume, some really good durability, and he just throws a lot of nice elbows and inside combinations, good uh, job of trapping the hands and uh, throwing shots over the top and things like that. But um, Gunnar Nelson is more of a guy that likes to move, try to use a lot of evasiveness, not get in the pocket with you, try to close the distance with you know, maybe a rear cross or some big kicks and then take you down and take your back and strangle you. And Brian Barberina, he's been fighting quite a bit frequently and he's been fighting a lot of good guys recently, a lot of legends. He's coming off a loss to Rafael Dos Anjos, but before that he beat Matt Brown, he beat uh, Robbie Lawler. But this is a way different fight. He's fighting a guy that's going to be trying to take him down like the RDA fight. And... That's been his Achilles heel throughout his whole career. He just does not have great takedown defense. Barbarina, when he gets taken down, he doesn't have the best grappling against elite grapplers. He tends to try to rush to get back up to his feet, give his back, and get submitted. He has been able to outgrapple some low-level grapplers like Sage Northcutt back in the day and some other guys. But with Gunner, that's obviously not going to be an option. And Barbarina doesn't have that range striking, so he has to get on the inside and get in that danger zone for a grappler to take him down, and it kind of really makes his style tough to deal with, or it's tough to win against a wrestler. Like we even saw a low level wrestler like Jason Wake at the victory over Barbarina, and Gunnar Nelson is a guy that's going to take minimal risk. He is fighting infrequently now. He fought last year in London. He's coming back to fight in London again this year, but he looked pretty good last year, and he's still relatively young he's not super old for uh welterweight at 34 and i just don't think he's going to give those opportunities to barbarina strike in the pocket with him he's going to be moving constantly he's going to be the faster guy on the feet he's going to probably be able to time the takedown get the takedowns pretty easily when he gets on top i think he's going to take the back of barbarina and from there i see him probably getting the choke at some point within the three rounds and if he can and barbarina just stays real defensively sound and composed and doesn't allow uh, the submission to get in there, then I just think Nelson's going to take a decision. So I'm pretty confident with Gunner with this style. It's just a tough style for Brian to deal with, man. I don't think he's going to stick in the pocket with Brian. He's way faster than him. And I think he's going to be able to get the takedowns pretty easily and has a huge gap in the advantage on the ground. So give me Gunner Nelson, and I'll say that he wins via second round. Or actually, I'll say he wins via first round rear naked choke. And we got the co-main event here, and this is an absolute banger and a pivotal fight in the UFC lightweight division. Justin Gaethje, he's been a former interim UFC champion. He competed for the undisputed belt, and the guy for years now has just been the man. And his last fight was his second opportunity at UFC gold against Charles Oliveira. And to me, he performed pretty bad. He, he was rushing, he was overextending, and I believe the moment got to him a little bit. He did hurt Charles at one point, but... Due to that, you know, Gaethje is in a position where he has two losses in his last three fights and he needs to defend his ranking gear. He's 34 years old and he has a lot of mileage. There's already some rumblings about if Gaethje is the same fighter and he has a lot to prove on Saturday. I feel Fazeev is the favorite and ever since stumbling his debut, it's been smooth sailing for Fazeev. He's reeled off six wins in a row. And Fazeev's last fight, he defeated a former UFC champion in Rafael Dos Anjos. It was also his first five-round main event. And now he's eyeing a title shot and defeating Justin Gaethje puts him very close to that ultimate goal. And Rafael Fazeev is an incredible kickboxer. He's extremely fast and explosive. Fazeev has great pressure footwork. He cuts the cage off very well. On the outside, Fazeev has brutal kicks. They're extremely fast and powerful. He can throw hard leg kicks, front kicks to the body, head kicks. He has great spins, flying knees, explosive actions. 
super fast hands, and he's mostly a counter puncher. He looks to counter with the left hook with the big right hand. Really good in the puck with his head movement and pull counters. He could roll and return with shots really well, slip and rip, and he's very composed. Doesn't waste energy. He always stays in position. He attacks the body to open up the head. Really good chin, too. He did get caught with a spinning back kick against Mustafaya, but almost anyone would not be able to take that shot. Fizev is hittable, and as I said, he likes to hang out and exchange in the pocket. That makes him, you know, obviously a little bit in the danger zone, but his upper body movement is really incredible. He has great head movement and great eyes and just ability to move out the way. And nine times out of 10, Fiziev is going to win that pocket battle. But Justin Gaethje is the fighter that has the ability to land one shot and end the fight. And one thing about Fiziev, he's going to have great cardio. That's something I think he has the edge here. We've seen multiple fights where Fiziev stays composed pushes a wild pace and he did get tired in the Bobby Green fight but I think that was more honestly due to Bobby Green getting in his head with all that trash talking and making uh Hoffield scream and chase him down I think that got Fazeev tired and Fazeev needs to stay composed but Gaethje isn't going to bring that type of fight where it's going to be a you know a trash talking fight I don't think and uh I think that Fazeev has the better cardio in this one and Justin Gaethje is a violence machine blood and guts fighter He's refined his striking style over the years, and he's much smarter now. He's famous for his leg kicks, and at range, he's constantly spamming them with evil intent. He does a good job of feigning his way in or using a high guard to close the distance and then those big hooks, those big uppercuts. He's improving at counter striking, and he's gotten much better at controlling distance, rolling and returning with counter punches. His last fight, for whatever reason, after Sid and Charles Oliveira down a couple times, he reverted back to his old ways. He was winging punches, which got him countered and hurt. And he can't lose his composure against Fazeev because Fazeev is a sniper and he's going to put uh, Gaethje out just like Oliveira did if he does do that. I think Gaethje is something that he should do in this fight would be to clinch, land short shots on the inside, try to slow Fazeev down. For Fazeev, I think he's going to want to try to attack the body and then come up with the uppercuts and knees. And that flying is very dangerous for Gaethje in this fight. And I think... Fiziev have a good chance of landing it. I don't see either guy grappling, so there's really no need to really talk about that. But I think Fiziev's going to get the knockout here. I see him getting the better of the kicking exchanges on the outside, which is going to make Gaethje have to pressure. On the inside, I see Fiziev landing clean counters, a lot of leg kicks and body kicks. And eventually, I think the accumulation of shots is going to add up. And I think Fiziev's going to find the opening for a big uppercut, big knee. And I'm going to say Fiziev wins via third round KO TKO in this fight. Justin Gaethje, man, he's uh, he's the man, but I think that Fazee is going to get him in this one. We finally got the conclusion of this trilogy here. I don't really see them fighting a four-time unless something really crazy happens. Leon Edwards versus Kamaru Usman. The winner is going to walk away with a welterweight belt. And Leon Edwards, man, he took the long road, Ed. He had to fight 15 times in the UFC before earning, earning a title shot. And... In the fight, all was lost, and he was able to have one of the most dramatic finishes in UFC championship history. Clearly down on the scorecards, had spent the last two rounds in a row getting dominated, and out of nowhere landed that head kick, changed his life. And even though Leon Edwards was coming into that fight with Usman on a big unbeaten streak, he still seemed like an afterthought. The first time around, he was fighting in a random location in Utah, and it just seemed like the UFC thought it was going to be another ho-hum tower defense for Kamaru Usman. But now that... Edwards won. The UFC is getting behind him. They're having him fight in England. And if he wins this fight, he's going to become a much bigger deal to the UFC. And Kamar Usman finally took a loss. He was 15-0 in the UFC before UFC 278. And he defended his title five times. He was approaching GSP status. And all that went up in smoke in that fifth round, man. Now Usman needs to correct that wrong and run off a few more title defenses to be called the welterweight goat, I feel. At 35, almost 36, we may be... See in the end if Usman loses. So there have already been rumors of retirement in the past. And um, this is a gigantic fight for his career. I don't know if he's going to come back and take a non-title fight if he loses. But Usman was clearly winning the first fight. So I'm sure he's confident he can come back. Or the second fight. So I'm sure he's confident he can come back and regain the strap. And I'm a little worried about Usman coming back a little less than six months after the knockout. It was a bad knockout. I think he probably should have taken... A little more time off, but um, it was the first time he ever been finished by strikes. And if he can grind Edwards for five rounds, the title is going to be his. So 
I've seen Leon Edwards talking a lot about how the elevation affected him and he expected to perform much better in London, which may be the case, but it does surprise me a little bit to hear him say that because before the fight, Edwards was speaking about how he slept in an elevation tent for his entire camp and came to Utah three weeks before the fight. So I'm not saying the elevation didn't have an effect, but Edwards was prepared for it. And I think Usman was the big reason why Edwards had the performance that he had. I think the fight was more competitive than people remember, though. Even when I went back and watched it, I remembered kind of those third and fourth rounds a lot more than the rest of the fight. Leon did win the first round with the takedown, the mount, the back threats. The second round, he was pretty competitive as well until about two minutes left in the round when he went for a bad takedown and really ended up losing the round and then Third and fourth rounds were dominant rounds for Usman, and that's what most people remember up until the knockout in the fifth. But stylistically, even though Edwards got the KO in the second fight, it's just a tough matchup. Leon Edwards is a low-volume striker. He could switch stance, and he's a sniper, but he likes to back himself up to the fence, and that allows Usman to control the distance, walk him down without having to worry about much offense coming his way. And Usman was able to back Edwards to the fence, land the jab, some big hooks, uppercuts, and Edwards is just waiting for the takedowns too much. Edwards is always so aware of the potential clincher level change that he just doesn't let his shots go enough. And he has to have more confidence to let his punches go here. He needs to get those front kicks up the body coming, the round kicks. Powerful crosses from both stances needs to be much more prevalent in this one. And when Leon lets go, he can land. It's just if he can let go and is free-flowing, can he stuff the takedowns and not get clinched? That's kind of the question. Usman has a clear massive advantage in the cage wrestling with the cardio. He knows what he has to do to win and that stay tight in the center. Don't throw much. Just walk Edwards down by being defensively sound. Use your jab or a flurry on Edwards after a feint against the cage. Clinch, work for takedowns, mat returns. Just lean on Edwards, get him tired. Usman is smart. He's not going to shoot bad takedowns in space and only shoots when he can back Edwards up. Usman didn't do a great job of holding Edwards down, even though he did in the later rounds, but he has the cardio to take Edwards down multiple time rounds and clinch him, and he won't get tired, so it doesn't really matter if he can hold him down. And Edwards has to have gotten some confidence now, though, knowing he can hurt Usman, and I think he's going to let go with more kicks. But ultimately, I just don't know how Edwards keep, keeps Usman from backing him up and pressuring him. I don't see him becoming a higher volume, higher volume striker who controls the center all of a sudden. And he uses his wrestling most of the time to deal with forward pressure, which he doesn't have the ability to do against Usman that effectively. We saw when he shot for takedowns outside of that one trip he got where I think he kind of surprised Usman in the first round. He was ineffective. Obviously, Edwards has shown he can land a head kick and end the fight but he showed he can win at any time too with the fifth round but I just think Usman is going to be smart pressure him to the fence not give him the opportunity to land that kill shot this time there were also a couple weird situations in the fifth round too which led to Leon even having the opportunity to land the click kick for one Herb Dean took him off the cage and reset them and Usman had him corralled there which I don't know if Leon would have been able to get off the cage with about two minutes left and Usman also did get frustrated because Leon kicked him low like two three times in just that fifth round alone and he was visibly mad in that last minute of the fight before he got caught and knocked out and I think he also believed that Leon was broken and wasn't pressing him like that so he could have you know decided to stay in space in the center more and not walk Edwards down like he was in the majority of the fight and that's what led to his demise. So in this one, I think Usman's not going to take a break. I think he's not going to let himself ever think that Leon Edwards is out of the fight, and I'm going to take him to win a decision, get his belt back. I just think he's going to do what he did the majority of the fight, get the victory. Edwards, obviously, is a live underdog. He already did it once. He has the crowd behind him. He's going to have the confidence. He, obviously, the younger guy. Usman just got knocked out. So there is some past to... Or reasons to believe that Edwards can win and some pass to victory for him too. But I just got to go with Usman here still. I think he's going to regain that belt and reclaim his throne at the welterweight division. As far as um, the rest of this video goes, guys, I really appreciate you guys watching. 
Um, hopefully you guys learned something from this video. I already have 10 bets out. I put a lot of work into uh, this UFC 286 card. So I'm feeling pretty confident about my picks and the bets that I have. So if you want to go get access to those 10 bets and um, access to some of the best betting tips available in the world, you know, currently top 10 in the world right now on BetMMATips dot or bet ma dot tips so you can go check me out third party tracked over 250 units profit over 20 units profit for this year and um you know obviously like i said i have 10 bets so go to patreon.com slash ma prediction guru for that i also have a bet on invicta already and like i said at the beginning of this video if i get three comments on this video asking me for an invicta breakdown i will put the video out on the channel tomorrow and um Besides that, guys, hit the like button, man. It's crazy. I mean, one out of 100 people hit the like button. What are you guys doing, man? Just press the button. It's free. It's easy. I'm giving you guys some good information. I would really appreciate it. It really helps the channel out. So uh, make sure to hit that like button. As far as my most confident pick of the week this week, um, I'm going to go with uh, with um, Jack Shore for that one. And for my party of the week, I'm going to go with Jake Hadley, Jack Shore, and Gunnar Nelson. So besides that, guys, um, let's try to get 150 plus likes on this video. Let's try to get 200. Let's try to blow it out the water. And um, thanks for watching, guys. I'll be back, like always, to break down fights for you guys really soon. And stay locked in the channel, and I'll talk to you guys later.